<laughs> yes, hello. Welcome to the second uh, panel on uh, of the eFlight Expo Forum we have this year here at Aero. Um, we had the first one this morning on eVTOLs. Now we're going to speak about the most important thing on electric aircraft, which is the electric propulsion system and the energy source. And uh, we mixed a little bit because in former years we just had all people just talking about motors and some other people talking, some other forums on just uh, energy source. This time we mix it all a little bit. We have some people talking about energy source. We have uh, the university, the DL, uh, better the DLR Research Institute, which is uh, very fresh. Uh, so it will be some news for you as well that we have a special institute now for this in Germany and uh, yes uh, just as a general information for you all um, when you're interested in electric uh, aviation electric flying together with the Aerofair we released this guide on electric flying here on the show there is in the middle of the magazine there is a map of the show and you find all the halls and in the halls which companies which associations are in the halls and tell you can tell you information about electric flying with this um, i think because the time is uh, you see i have a lot of speakers and the time is short so i hand over to philip scheffel from the company apus uh, who is working on aircraft with electric propulsion you can see their first uh, prototype at the a7 hall and yeah philip it's yours tell us what you're doing you're welcome here on the fair nice to see there are some people in the in, around here um, yeah apus group is uh, do you see something already no i see it but you don't see it come around <laughs> Yeah, then maybe first to my person. Um, I'm Philip Scheffel, the CEO of uh, Apus Group, um, glider pilot uh, since many years, um, and uh, so passion for energy efficiency. Um, I was working for 10 years at Stemme, um, an aircraft producer close to Berlin, and since 2014 we started an own um, a um, aviation engineering design office. And uh, since that time, we are developing uh, for OEMs uh, several systems, uh, structures, undercarriage, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, since a few years, uh, three or four years, the focus is more and more on uh, powertrain systems uh, in aviation, the third revolution, as we call it, in aviation. So also, uh, design office uh, needs to focus uh, on that. Um, and uh, that's what we are doing here. Um, yeah, we are, uh, as I said, in the east of Berlin. No, now we have it. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, we can switch already to the second uh, slide. Yeah, that's the privilege of the first speaker. Everything can be tested with me. So, <laughs> yeah, what you see here is the, one of our projects, this uh, Apus I-5 um, uh, cooperation uh, project with uh, Royce Royce. Uh, we are developing together uh, with partners uh, powertrains up to one megawatt uh, and test them on uh, a platform that is capable to do it. And uh, yeah, this is one of the projects what you see here on the first page. Yeah, since uh, we can focus on those uh, powertrains, we set our goal. And the goal is uh, to fly totally emission-free uh, within the next uh, two years. And uh, we figure out some solutions from the whole spectrum. And uh, our solution is uh, hydrogen um, used by the fuel cell. And uh, yeah, that's what we are doing in APUS. Um, as I said, uh, we are close to Berlin, east of Berlin in Strasberg. Uh, nowadays, 35 engineers there. We have a workshop uh, to produce whole aircraft structures, whole airframe. 
um, and so we do design certification until prototyping and flight test there. We are uh, a EASA design organization, so we um, have some privileges uh, during uh, certification and making permitted flights and also for the flight testing. That's uh, some advantage. And yeah, some reference projects uh, from the past, um, just to get a short overview. But I don't want to extend too much. I think there are some other speakers who want to pre present themselves too. Hello. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. And I'm sure uh, I at least have several more questions which we can do later. And we have also the possibility that why we try to keep it as short as possible that you get just an uh, intro and then you can ask your own questions. Uh, so we'll have a microphone going around after the speakers are finished. Uh, next speaker is from a company which we have on a re very regular base in our electric events, the company Rolls-Royce. And Ying Ying, uh, tell us what the, it's the latest development in your department at Rolls-Royce. Okay. So, um, hopefully you can hear me well. I don't have slides. <laughs> So first of all, very nice to meet you here again after two years of pandemic. I've been a, a few words to, to, to myself. Um, I've been a visitor, regular visitor of this show since 2012. And I'm very happy to be able to visit here again after two years of um, break. And here I'm very happy to meet my partners and also my colleagues and even my competitors here. So it's a very nice show and I hope you are also to enjoy it. For personal information, I've studied in Aachen and worked for DLR for five years and also Airbus for five years and in 2017 I joined the Siemens e-aircraft and since then, since 2019, we are part of the Rolls-Royce Electrical community. And Rolls-Royce Electrical is a global distributed um, organization and I'm very happy to Say hello to our side lead from Norwegian in the, uh, in the public and also from Hungary, Gergit. Raise your hand. So I'm very happy to be here and to, uh, to be able to discuss with the, um, all of you. So what we are doing in Rolls-Royce Electrical, we are developing complete electric propulsion system for advanced aerial mobility. So this includes um, urban air mobility that is e-vitals and also commuter aircraft. So commuter aircraft is um, pas small passenger aircraft carrying four to n up to 19 passengers and will op predominantly operate it on short ranges below 200 nautical miles. We really believe this is the market segment that will enable the mark early market entry of electrification or electric propulsion technology. So, I think that's all for what uh, I want to say. Pass it to the next one. Okay, so if you pass the mic. Uh, and now we would have slides again. We were the slides which were on the screen already. Yeah, perfect. And perhaps if you want, if you want to see your slides, you can stand uh, there. Otherwise, Otherwise you need uh, a I, mirror. I have a, I have a PPT. <laughs> okay, that's good. No, but the PPT is now not on there. That's my mistake. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 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 Well, stay. So thanks for the introduction, Willy, and uh, thanks, of course, for the invitation and the great possibility to speak here this afternoon. And of course, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great uh, to see the EFLAT community uh, unite again after the COVID times here uh, this year at the Aero 2022 in Friedrichshafen. Um, today I am speaking on behalf of the High Flag Consortium, um, which is an, uh, is it this one? No, it's this one, that's the laser pointer. I think it's the green one in the middle. Oh yeah. Um, it, this is an R&D collaboration of two German technology firms, um, a German university and an Austrian-based flight test expert. And um, our team combines long-term expertise uh, in the fields of aeronautical engineering, hydrogen fuel cell systems, um, as well as ground and flight testing and e-mobility um, road and flight base in general. 
Um, the project is supported by the German Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action within the ZIM funding line. So that is to foster the uh, innovative capacity of small and medium enterprises. My name is Kai Kemke and I specialize in uh, aeronautical engineering, uh, especially aircraft design and electric propulsion at Casero in Stuttgart, Germany. And I'm happy to present our project today. So what is HiFly about? Uh, as our brand name suggests, um, we focus on green hydrogen as a power source and are keen to bring this technology into general aviation, where it makes sense. And we believe it makes sense wherever range and endurance matter, and also our carbon footprint, of course. For example, to the private pilot, um, planning short, medium and long range cruising flights, cross country flights, or to flight schools, um, or clubs in need for flight time instead of time on the ground for recharging. And hydrogen, hydrogen can be the key solution to many of those problems uh, we face with sustainable flight today. Um, however, um, a few requirements must be met for a hydrogen fuel cell system to deliver a genuine alternative to combustion engines or batteries. Um, it must be affordable um, in terms of purchase and operating costs. Um, it should be lightweight. Um, for um, enabling integration into very light aircraft, VLA, or even ultralights. Um, and uh, it should be easy to operate um, for new pilots or to simplify transition. And we ask ourselves the questions, can this be done um, without completely rethinking the airframe? Can it be done without using complex solutions such as liquid hydrogen or similar? or without waiting for the magic formula, but instead using technology readily available today. We think so by sheer simplification and uh, by exploiting synergies with other market segments. So here's an overview of our system. We store hydrogen in a spherical tank made from carbon fiber composites in a, an automated winding process. And the result is much lighter than everything we've seen, we've seen so far. We use an off-the-shelf PM fuel cell stack um, that is soon to be mass produced within the automotive industry and keeps the costs low. Um, we operate the stack at approximately half of its rated power, um, um, which makes uh, the surrounding devices, the periphery, much lighter and simpler. And it helps with efficiency as well. Regarding the EPU, there is no magic battery requirement. Just a straightforward peak power source that will support takeoff and climb. Um, it is recharged during cruising flight. It works with proven battery cells that are on the market today. Another question would be, where would all the hydrogen come from? And uh, our project partner, PS Hitech, bridges this gap and fills, yeah, fills the missing link uh, because they do not only focus on the usage of hydrogen um, in fuel cells, in mobile applications, or even or stationary applications, but they also focus on uh, the production. Um, their vision is to have a decentralized, cost-effective, and green system using domestic renewables. Last but not least, our demonstrator. As you've probably seen in Hall B1, um, the Flight Design F2E um, has uh, received uh, a new look, and it's just the beginning. Um, it's a proven airframe. Um, it has, offers excellent performance and flying characteristic, and for our system, um, plenty of integration space. And uh, thanks to Flight Design, uh, during this year, the aircraft will be retrofitted with a fuel cell system and is going to be ready for testing soon. Stay tuned and don't miss the opportunity to meet Flight Design and the High Flight team at uh, Stand 101 in Booth B1. In Booth 101 in Hall B1, sorry. <laughs> a prototype of the hydrogen tank is also on display. Thanks, Guy. And uh, I think it's interesting that some years ago we had a fuel cell already flying at the Aero a long time ago but uh, then it was quite 
calm around uh, fuel cell activities in aviation. And now it's very nice because we have the Hi-4, which is an Angry A7, and they are flying even with passengers now for proving of concept. And we have you coming up with a new solution. So, um, because battery and the bat energy density of battery is still the factor which keeps electric aviation from being on the market and flying. So if hydrogen can be one of the parts, it would be great. Um, our next speaker is Professor Lars Enghardt from a very new institute, as I hear. Uh, it's from DLR, the German Research Institute. So, and I'll let you introduce yourself and your institute. Thank you very much. So, uh, good evening. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Lars Engert and I'm the acting head of the new DLR Institute, which was founded in the mid of the year 2020, right after the beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> um, in Cottbus. So, um, electrified aero engines is our topic, is our um, yeah, mission. The mission is to, um, the whole institute is, in its research is dedicated uh, on low emission future aircraft engines for commercial aviation. And uh, we are aiming at more climate friendly and quiet air traffic of the future, which is, uh, as we can see here on, on this fair, um, for instance, based on uh, hydrogen propulsion. We think this is uh, part of, or will be part of the propulsion future. So uh, we think that uh, we might be able to close gaps in the portfolio of German engine research. Um, the whole thing is focused on propulsion systems with significantly, and this is uh, one of the research topics, increased complexity and high requirements in terms of, for instance, in terms of intelligent control. So um, the future is brought with alternative um, aero propulsion and uh, we, the whole institute is scientifically orientated towards alternative, more extensively electrified aircraft engine. Um, what we are planning to do is a, a holistic approach. You can see here our research profile which starts off with uh, uh, the different components uh, which um, um, uh, will <clears throat> then be uh, put together to form an architecture of uh, novel propulsion systems. I don't want to go into detail of the text because uh, other speakers are, <laughs> are waiting to, to, uh, to introduce themselves as well. Uh, very important from our point of view, and I think most of you will agree on this, is uh, aeronautical requirements. We really have to get this not only flying, but also being certified and licensed. And uh, this is something which is a showstopper from our point of view. So aeronautical requirements is really uh, a big issue in terms of um, electrified propulsion systems of the future. Um, last but not least, and the environmental impact, of course, that's one of the reasons why we are all doing this. Uh, we want to lower or even reduce the um, environmental impact of uh, um, future propulsion systems. I already spoke about control. Control is a big issue. We don't want to uh, overwhelm the pilot of the future with uh, complicated systems, so the control system plays a very important role in the future. And of course, uh, because uh, there is uh, all these systems are pretty new, though there is really the lack of models. And what we are going to do is erect experimental facilities to test and then build um, on the uh, test results new uh, models uh, which uh, allow to design or even pre-design such, such systems uh, to be um, um, facilitated or focused on, 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 on specified um, future um, aircraft. So this is my last slide, just to give you an idea what we are going to do in Cottbus. Uh, there will be a new um, um, office building of course but which is more what is really more important is that we are going to 
uh, erect uh, four uh, large scale experimental facilities which will allow us to test um, different kinds of uh, electrified propulsion systems due to um, 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 on, on the basis of, of different um, approaches so electromagnetic um, um, Magnetic uh, stuff is, is, is tested, then we have high voltage, we are going to do tests on components and last but not least we want to build up a realistic environment where we will test the whole uh, propulsion system under conditions, uh, flight conditions in, in, um, in about 30,000 meter um, flight, sorry 10,000 meter, 30,000 feet uh, flight uh, envelope. So, um, last but not least, uh, yeah. Uh, currently, we are we are uh, the, the the institute is newly founded. So um, uh, we have around 30 employees at the time being. But of course, we are hiring. So at the end, in the end, in five years, we want to become 150. So if you're interested in working on uh, research in um, future propulsion, electrified future propulsion systems. Please visit our booth um, in Hall A7. We are on the Common Brandenburg Berlin booth, and you can find someone there to discuss uh, what our research of the future will be and how you might contribute to this, um, yeah, to this approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just this telephone which was ringing, it's not from us. It was left here on the stage. So if you see anybody who's looking for his cell phone it was left on the stage here we'll keep it here and i shut off the tone now so it won't disturb us anymore so uh, so we saw the research side on electric propulsion systems now we continue to a uh, motor or exact uh, say better propulsion system design company which is the company MGM Compro and Jakob Henschel. He is um, head of uh, marketing in this company. And so, Jakob, if you can give us, he uh, perhaps saying something behind which he will say they are doing a lot. You, 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 uh, they're doing a lot of uh, different systems, VTOLs, non VTOLs, and I think they were the company which had the most different aircraft with their system already flying over the last years here at Aero. So now your presentation is up and the uh, stage is yours. So, thank you really for the longest uh, presentation before I'm going to present. So, uh, welcome everybody here at Aero Friedrichshafen. It's a pleasure for me to see you face to face after some time and I'm uh, glad to uh, present to you who we are, what we do, and where are we heading. So, we at MGM Compro, as we already said, are the uh, electric engineers who started uh, basically 30 years ago with uh, our own design of electronic speed controllers. But throughout the time, uh, the story developed uh, quite a lot, and right now, we are designers, developers, and also manufacturers of the complex electric propulsion systems. Right now, uh, f beginning from a couple of kilowatts up to 400 kilowatts uh, in the development projects I'm going to talk about uh, a bit later. Uh, we have our own R&D facilities, as I said, we're 30 years on the market, uh, even though our role developed throughout the time. Uh, we are a team of 50 professionals right now. We're based in the Czech Republic, uh, Central Europe, not that far from here. And uh, we export right now to more than 50 countries in the world. Uh, here is basically our product portfolio. Not everything is uh, for sure done just by us, but also in cooperation with our, our partners. But talking about the core components, electronic speed controllers, uh, battery management system, battery packs, the overall design of the battery packs is done by us. So not just electrical engineers, but we have also our own mechanical department uh, under one roof, which is a great I would say advantage we have right now 
and we are heading right now towards our own range of the, the electric motors. There's a big project of building a new facility is going on, so uh, the future is going to be, uh, uh, from my point, even more interesting uh, as it was until now. So, uh, to briefly give you an overview of what we do, what projects we are involved in, uh, you can see that uh, uh, we are really the pioneers of the electrifying, as, as, as we already said. Uh, we have uh, tens of projects already flying, some of them are going into series production already, so uh, it's uh, much more about the certifications right now, not just flying demonstrators, but this is what we can uh, talk about further in the discussion. So, uh, the main aim right now is going towards higher performance outputs, which is, let's say, above 150 kilowatts, and this is where our two current development projects are, are placed. Uh, Here's something about the, the, the Comington class aircraft electric power train, the one of the projects, the biggest project we're working right now, all together with our partners, which should be finalized until 2025. And uh, this should uh, pave uh, the way towards a, let's say, fully electric commuter class soon. Here, here are some of our reference projects, maybe you're aware of them. Uh, this, these all are with our uh, propulsion, propulsion systems. Uh, here are some of the, some of the references. So, uh, we work both with the big guys and also with the development startups, let's say, also with the, with the research institutes, universities, so the, so the, the, the range is, is quite wide. So that's, that's all from my side, and in case you have any questions, just stop by at our booth and, you know, whole A7, you're welcome. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, if you have questions, you also can stay here and ask a question soon after Ken uh, will give us his overview from the United States. Uh, because we always try to bridge a little bit the gap, which especially now in Corona times has become even bigger between as we couldn't travel so much anymore. So BFS is uh, an organization where you will give us some more information about it. And yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm just waiting for the yeah, slide yeah. to get up there. Uh, so I'm representing the Vertical Flight Society. Uh, some of you may know it as the American Helicopter Society. We were founded in 1943. And we're a community, really, of uh, industry, academia, and government. We have six and a half thousand individual members and 180 corporate members. Uh, primarily working in the field of vertical flight. Now, of course, the industry has changed, and because we're a member-based society, a lot of what happens in our organization comes at the initiative of our members. We have 24 technical committees, but in 2014, we held our first eVTOL technical meeting in Washington with 100 people there, and they were the real visionaries on the eVTOL market. As the market has changed, we've evolved as well. And what we've seen is a continuum developing uh, within the eVTOL world of uh, personal and package to short haul. And as the range and the payload range gets extended, we have changes in the technology and the configuration of the aircraft. And then what we've seen more recently is changes in configuration from eVTOL to eStall with distributed electric propulsion and then to conventional and at the same time to address the payload range issues we've seen the uh, uh, choice of battery electric, hybrid electric and hydrogen electric to address either the endurance or the payload range and there's this continuum and we as an organization much like I guess Uber back in 2016 put out this idea of ecosystem 
that it wasn't simply the distributed electric propulsion, but it was also the infrastructure. As an organization, because we're industry, academia, and government, we've stretched in that respect as well. So one of the things that we did was in 2017, when the industry was still quite young, we started to track the programs. Our members were saying, what are all these things? They're traditional helicopter people to a certain extent. And when we put up the first uh, evtol.news um, uh, 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 ledger of aircraft, we could only come up with about eight at that time. I'm sure Willie had more, but to us, uh, in North America, and I'm a Canadian speaking on the behalf of a US-based organization. Uh, we could only come up with eight concepts. This is where we are today in terms of the concepts, and on our website we have every one of these. Now, not all of them are real, there's from the silly to the serious, but it tells you how this segment has exploded, and behind each of these programs, of course, is a propulsion system as well. Uh, the other thing in terms of definition stretch that's taken place is that we've gone from urban air mobility to advanced air mobility. NASA has adopted that term and what that encompasses is no longer just eVTOL but eSTOL and eCTOL as we call it, electric conventional and it stretches into the regional air mobility and as a regional airline guy who used to work for Bombardier to Havilland and Canadair, uh, I see some analogies here where uh, 20 years ago, we were dealing with regional jets and turboprops and what was the crossover point between those two different propulsion systems. We're in a similar era today where the propulsion system is changing and the market's evolving as well. Um, and so these things share common architecture and that there's the batteries, the motors and whatever. And in both cases, these are part 23 certified aircraft. So even the certification category is stretching for both vertical flight and for fixed wing, where they're both under the same bucket. And from my hometown in Vancouver, we see this um, very clearly. We already have urban air mobility where half a million people don't go to the airport to fly. They fly in helicopters, they fly on seaplanes. And you can see the duplication of the routes, but the technology that people here on the table are going to be developing will also be filling those, those market requirements. And the last thing I mentioned is we're doing the electric aircraft symposium as well, so that's a full stretch of the organization. Oops. Thank you very much, Ken. And I know very well that you do these forums because we uh, changed. Uh, I come to your forums, you speak at our forums, and I think like this we try also to bridge the around the world because this is one thing which is really amazing inside the aviation. And now uh, for you, um, if one of you wants to ask any questions. My colleague Sin has a microphone here, just lift your hand and you can ask any questions until the first question will come. I will ask my question, which, which I have. Um, yes, so on the hydrogen, especially uh, at APOS, um, I know you told me something which is not in your uh, presentation here, but I was quite interested in uh, this technology where you said okay you have also an additional thing you're working on which is storing the hydrogen because the storage of the hydrogen this is one of the difficult issues because uh, if liquid you have to cool it and if you have it in a tank and you leave it there for two weeks uh, most of it or a lot of it is gone and so can you tell us a little bit more on this I think it's a kind of solid uh, way of storing the energy which is in hydrogen uh, which could be used for example for the backup part of the uh, energy which you have to supply because all of us as we are most of us are pilots we know that if you fly an aircraft you have to have a reserve and if it's a commercial aircraft you have to have a very defined quite long reserve considered how short the electric aircraft fly at the moment so maybe you can tell us something about it yes so, uh, what you're speaking about is the uh, sodium, uh, use, using sodium uh, to uh, store hydrogen. But first, I have to advertise, of course, our favorite solution, uh, what we are using right now. This is 
uh, to use simply pressurized hydrogen in, uh, in our wings and use the very strong uh, fuel tanks uh, as the carrying uh, wing structure. That's what you can uh, visit when you go through this door directly on the corner on uh, hall A7. So that's what we are doing. Um, one big challenge uh, is of course um, for the future to uh, produce green hydrogen. Uh, today we have uh, only 0.1% uh, of the needed green hydrogen uh, of the needed hydrogen is produced green. So we have a huge need to produce hydrogen. So we have to use all kinds of producing hydrogen. Um, what we can get. And one of those uh, solutions is to use uh, seawater by electrolysis and um, split the uh, natrium, the sodium, from the chlor. And uh, later, from chemistry, maybe you know, still this uh, process when you uh, put uh, sodium into water, it's a, a strong exotherm reaction and uh, the hydrogen comes out uh, from there. Um, the, so, there are some advantages uh, in this uh, value chain of producing uh, hydrogen in that way and uh, this should show only, we are not focusing only on one solution for storing hydrogen, we are looking around. Okay, thank you. Um, Chinying, uh, quest, how does Rolls-Royce look onto hydrogen versus battery? Uh, one is long term, one is short term. How are you playing? I know you're mainly working on the commuter side of the aircraft. So, and we maybe expect that commuters will be the first larger aircraft which will fly. Uh, because, like, until we have all the regulation for a beetle, it may be taking a little bit longer. So, yeah, uh, what do you think of this way of storing the energy? Um, first of all, of course, we also notice the energy storage is one of the technological challenge for the um, electrification and we well realize the battery has some limitation concerning the energy density. However, um, most of our customers and partners are still working at this stream, so we, um, we do have our battery program supporting this trend um, and also I believe hydrogen will um, provide our option for the mid and long term but for the short term, let's say towards the year 2024, 2025, this is still one of the most viable um, options for, for both for UAM and for commuter segment. Thank you. Um, a question to Kai would be, um, you're working on the uh, hydrogen solution at Casaero or Highfly. Uh, yes. I think it's two companies which uh, Highfly is a project, yeah. Casaero is a company behind. Casaero uh, uh, is one of the companies one behind, it's yeah. also, Casaero does the aircraft part, um, most, mostly PSI Tech does the fuel cell part and um, um, we also have the University of Applied Sciences, uh, Wurzburg Schweinfurt with us in the team and they are due the testing, all the lab and ground testing. And uh, do you, you have, a, you mentioned the F2E as a, probably first project here you have going to have there. Are there also, for example, VTOL projects uh, where you think of using this kind of uh, the technology or is this more further out? Uh, I think it's more further out, especially for our solution because we try uh, with a simple and small fuel cell stack, small and compact system, uh, just to get uh, the thing into the air. And as we all know, VTOL uses a lot of energy. Um, an aircraft does so as well, but only for takeoff and climb. Um, and the power demand is much lower. So we, um, we've been speaking about 150 kilowatts, which you are targeting right now uh, with the electric motors, with the EPUs. We stay around 60, 70, um, just for uh, having the dimension for that. Okay, I would have a question uh, which is going still a, a little bit on the topic of hydrogen. Um, Professor Engelhardt, you have the, uh, um, there is a DLR institute or there are other DLR institutes which are working on fuel cell technology. Um, 
are you collaborating? Would you also work on the fuel cell part or are you just focused on the electric motor part with your new institute? No, the new institute is dedicated to a holistic approach and uh, um, I would say that uh, most of the institutes which are uh, currently active or were currently active before this new institute was founded they are looking um, on electric flying or electrified aero engines from a, from a, from a bottom-up approach and we are looking more from a top-down approach which means that uh, um, these other institutes, um, most of them, they are looking on the development of the cell, fuel cell technology as an energy source and we are looking from the perspective of the whole uh, aero engine or even more important aircraft and see whether the integration, uh, how the integration takes place, how we get this uh, new novel propulsion system into a specified aero engine, aero, um, sorry, uh, in, into a specified uh, uh, system and how these two components interact with each, with each other. So is this, uh, we have to design, a specifically design a propulsion system and of course the airplane around it and then there is an interaction between both and this is the integration task, task where we will spend a lot of research on and we think that this is an optimization loop which, uh, which takes time and uh, development of course. Okay, thank you. Um, Jakob, a question to you. Um, have you been involved, as I know you worked in, with very different projects in different countries, also in fuel cell projects or let's say electric aircraft project where fuel cell were the power source already? Or is this are you, your project up to now just basically working with batteries? Yeah, uh, I. We have to take it the same as Rosso said, we have to take it from the customer's perspective first as an SME and <laughs> there's no other way you know, to do it. So the um, majority of our projects is battery based, uh, lithium ion, lithium polymers uh, use the most and uh, uh, regarding hydrogen, yeah, we see a great future and it definitely, but from our point of view there's no time um, to be wasted, you know, from our point of view. Uh, don't take it personally, you know, we don't have that much uh, uh, governmental money to be to be spent and uh, we have to be backed by our own money. So that's why we are market driven, that's why we have customers and that's why our projects are barrier based. Okay. E even though it's, it's uh, yeah, it has a lot of disadvantages, uh, which is obvious. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are a lot of indications right now that governments around the world are going to put more money in all the uh, things around the hydrogen, all the chains, uh, production, storage uh, and uh, propulsion system for cars and all different other things. So maybe we'll see more in the coming up years. Uh, I would have the last question on hydrogen now uh, to Ken. Um, I know you, the VFS also had a, pa uh, a, a panel or it, uh, it was a, I think it was a weekend of research on hydrogen. Um, we all know Zero Avia, one of the more famous players around there. Are there other companies working on concrete hydrogen fuel cell projects in aviation you're aware of? Yeah, the, well, what VFS did was about a year ago we formed a hydrogen council. That organization is now split in two, one focused on the OEMs and the vehicles and a second group looking at airports and infrastructure as well. And we were holding monthly meetings, virtual meetings of course, which actually were quite beneficial to grow the organization up to maybe about 300 people and it was at the end of March in uh, Long Beach that VFS had a hybrid event, about 100 people on site and 30 people virtually focused on hydrogen and aerospace. Um, Zeravia of course had announced in late last year a number of different partnerships with De Havilland, with MHI, RJ, uh, with Alaska Airlines. Uh, Universal Hydrogen is another company that's looking at um, uh, uh, retrofits. 
in both cases, they're looking at you know a 19 seat to say 70 seat capacity regional airlines. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, very early on an eVTOL company out of Massachusetts um, that was looking at hydrogen, and I think maybe four years ago, Urban Aeronautics in Israel was talking about leapfrogging uh, battery systems from turbines to going to hydrogen. Um, what you're seeing, one of the reasons this is happening, the Biden administration announced a billion dollar support to hydrogen infrastructure in the U.S. as part of the um, stimulation, the trillion dollar budget. So in there, there was a, uh, to surprise to some, uh, largely focused on automotive, but there is an aviation component to that. Similarly, in Canada, there's a green aviation initiative in, um, particularly in Canada, uh, Canada and Quebec, where there's funding going towards green aviation and hydrogen is on the list there. Uh, so a lot of it's grassroots. Uh, I think that Europe's more advanced in terms of the thinking around sustainable aviation. I think if you talk to people in the US and Canada a couple of years ago, they say, what are you talking about? But it's definitely coming around and they're looking to Europe in some ways for some of the leadership. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question would be on uh, pure electric aviation again. Seeing that uh, when we look at the vehicles, everybody talks about that one of the highest uh, bur uh, hurdle will be getting into certification because uh, it's not only like if you look here and there is a big difference here and if you look at the left side at the B-Hold which is ultralight aviation on the right side we have certified aviation where the, the big the aircraft look very similar but there is a big uh, difference in the cost if you want to do a certified aircraft it takes much longer it's not. now we're going to electrification there has been shown several light projects and uh, now to continue the question what about the um, where you, you where you you are with the certification because you we have seen over the last years the uh, LSA ultralight project with an electric motor which at that time it was still Siemens electrical in the end it was Rolls-Royce like the flight design F2E was flying with a motor under the under the two flags first as Siemens later as Rolls-Royce um, are you working on this path as well or is this bad is it more that you say no with these the market for us will be more the larger aircraft the commuter side um, yes First of all, currently our okay. currently our product development effort are concentrated on two market segments. The first one is urban air mobility, that is EV tolls, um, and the second one is commuter. Because we believe the market penetration will start in this segment, and um, we haven't fully stopped the general aviation motor development. Um, we still have a certification program running, um, but the main effort is concentrated in this two segment because we have detected more customer pool from there. Okay, I think there is a question from the uh, audience. Yeah. It's on uh, battery technology. So one of the advantages, um, as I understand it, of conventional fossil fuel is it's not inherently combustible, it needs oxygen. So when we have battery technology, they can, as far as I understand, uh, like burst into flames if there's a short circuit. So my question is, how big of an issue for all electric flying is this, or how, how do you deal with this? Because safety is one of, in my experience, uh, sometimes the deciding factor of whether you can use te a technology or not. So, question to anyone who's... So maybe you... we can get the opinion of everybody, quick answer on, on, on this, or everybody would like to answer on it. I think uh, safety is one of the distinct advantages which electrification or electric propulsion system can provide. For example, um, if we design our electric propulsion system, we have multi-lane concept. That means in case of a single failure, we 
and if it's a four-lane architecture, you will only lose 25% of the um, achievable power, and which still make your aircraft by far much more safer than a conventional um, combustion engine, because you probably don't have this sec um, separation of power um, delivered so conveniently. So that's my opinion. Um, from experience with um, automotive, we know that um, uh, batteries, which are, I think, the main risk associated with electric propulsion, uh, can be quite uh, quite safe. And um, fires, car fires, um, related to driven kilometers, are lower with um, uh, batteries than our conventional um, um, cars. And um, uh, we can, I think, we can. Uh, keep and even um, increase the level of safety uh, in the aviation world. Yeah, also from our perspective, uh, definitely uh, safety first, as always, but I see the biggest value added in the approach in uh, um, how you prevent from the uh, let's say, dangerous events which might might uh, happen within the battery. It's about the sensors, it's about the battery management systems, you know, how you, how you uh, collect and, and evaluate the data, how you react on the situations before something fails critically. And this is also our approach. And then there, are, there, are, there is a second thing, which is how to react if through all this, something happens. You know, some safety uh, extinguishing systems and 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 etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of development going on, and also this is uh, a knowledge mainly uh, driven by automotive sector. And uh, this is this is it. Yeah. But the prevention should also be a a big big issue. I'll just add that we're in an unusual sort of interim period where the existing regulations regarding motors and fuel systems don't accommodate electric motors and batteries. But the regulators, of course, are very focused on how to address it, whether it's through special conditions or writing the new rules. And I feel confident that in order to achieve certification, this will be addressed in the rules we're just in this gray interim area where the rules have not yet been finalized. Okay, thank you. Any other question at the moment here? No? Then I have a question. We at the bow at the morning in the morning we had in the discussion with the eVTOL manufacturers, we talked uh, about the different approach of some saying we want to have a pilot on board, others said we want to fly autonomous like Whisk Aero from the beginning. Now the question is if everything is running fine probably we don't need a pilot. But in our aviation, like we have it right now, even if it's an automated landing, automated flying Airbus, which is flying already quite a long while, normally the fallback, if something is going wrong, is always going to the pilot. Now, if you have an electric, highly automated electric propulsion system on board, um, when you're designing this propulsion system, are you thinking of we still have a pilot who will solve the problem if there is a problem? Or will you, would you go and say, no, it's all electronic and we have also to get the fallback as fast as possible into uh, the automation that uh, in the end the pilot's just watching. So perhaps Kai, if you uh, can think, if in your system, uh, do you think of a highly automated system or mainly something which would be like the aircraft here? You still need a pilot with a lot of experience. Um, our system is designed for ease of use, of course, and um, it should work in, uh, the controller should work in the background, um, meaning the aircraft should be flown um, like a conventional electric aircraft. Uh, so the fuel cell system would be controlled in the background. Uh, we have some, some, some safety features. Um, what I believe should, uh, especially for CS uh, certification, uh, should be uh, implemented is um, just in case if the fuel cell system fails, like you always have a sufficient reserve, uh, whatever it may be, uh, I would suggest at least the go around and the traffic pattern. Uh, inside the battery if the fuel cell system fails and otherwise uh, uh, 
the other way around. Okay, thank you, Professor Enghardt. When you do your research or you plan your research, there is uh, from the. Are you mainly looking at the efficiency of the propulsion system, or would also think like this uh, fallback autonomous flight, or a, uh, as much as possible autonomous propulsion system be a question of your research? I think the first priority would be efficiency and uh, environmental. Um, compatibility and uh, I would say um, um, yeah low emissions of course this is the first priority the second uh, will then be um, um, that the handling so that uh, security and safety and security is really the, the big issue and uh, after this of course if control works we can look at auto autonomous flight but uh, as we are focusing on regional aircraft I would say at the time being we are looking at pilot systems, so that's the state of the art we are looking at and from my point of view, um, if everything works and is certified, the next step will be to think about uh, autonomous flight. But uh, I'm not speaking about general aviation in this case. Uh, that's clear. Uh, Jinyi, uh, on this uh, question, uh, as Rolls Royce you're working with VTOL and a lot of people in the discussion of uh, the efficiency of VTOL, they say, okay, the end goal must be the autonomous because it gets the aircraft more efficient. If you fly VTOL, if you fly passengers in a small aircraft, they have four seats, three seats. If you can get rid of the pilot, uh, you get one more seat to sell, which makes a better business case. Uh, is this is it a discussion or do you leave this discussion at the manufacturers and say, okay, we deliver you the propulsion system you want and if you want it to have it, also the fallback situations handled autonomously, we incorporate this. So first of all, if you talk about business case, uh, I think the autonomous flying, if there is a lack of uh, certification basis and or that regulatory bodies. Um, I don't think there is a business in sh uh, case insight for short term, that's for sure. So, but, so we deliver our product into, um, our, want to deliver into our existing market. So, and we want to, of course, um, help our customers and also the airframers to be able to deliver um, this kind of autonomous flying system. Um, and the electric propulsion is inherently easier to control and uh, or, the, or the control, autonomous control is easier to implement and so we, our contribution, contribution is like in that in the first place and once you have established rules for autonomous flight or, or established regulations for that and there is a product product inside, of course, we will also deliver it into that. Okay, thank you. Um, there is one thing which I consider is quite interesting for the uh, electric aviation in general, which is uh, when systems will be ready for the market. Because if you look back 10 years, uh, we have the EFLED Expo since more than 10 years. And 10 years ago, people were saying, yeah, in three years, we have your pro our products on the market. Uh, we, we have the Pipistrel, which is this aircraft which is certified, which is selling. Apart from this, there is not much at the moment. We will see more. We will have a fixed wing session where I think fixed wing trainer and fixed wing commuter session on Friday, where we perhaps see things which are closer to the market. But just from your point of view, when do you think uh, the first part 23? system will be fully certified in part 23 electric propulsion system and when we will see it uh, on the market in let's say a four-seater aircraft and uh, then perhaps this question to you three because you're all working on uh, this kind of aircraft like for perhaps philip first and then yeah, of course, we are always very optimistic. I see here Axel Lange, uh, when you started with hydrogen uh, powertrain, uh, maybe 15 years ago, <laughs> when somebody asked you at that time <laughs> when it will be certified, what would you uh, reply? We always reply in two years. And this is the same in here. <laughs> no, we really think, uh, so our aircraft uh, 
the, the power trains are running, uh, we are working on that and uh, the goal is in 25 we want to uh, have uh, certification. Special conditions are there on that, at least when we don't talk about autonomous flying, only about the power train, there is a realistic path. Yeah. Okay. I think um, it's usual if you have a new technology, we, we, everybody probably know the hype curve of Gardner curve that you um, expect high expectation that somewhere you will have the valley of tears and but I think now somewhere you will also then um, reach the um, uh, constant expectation where all the stakeholders come to similar um, conclusion where the system could be certified so based on our knowledge and also um, publications uh, most of the eVTO manufacturers aiming at her um, entering to market by 2024-25 as uh, Philip said and that's also our um, realistic view on that we think it can be realistically expected for the year 2025 and 2026 and that's also our timeline. Okay. Um, I agree with the opinion um, uh, about 2025. Um, I would also say because um, uh, I've been looking at electric aircraft in the past 10 years and see the designs mature from, from um, small solutions to CS22 certified solution and it's only the next step. Uh, that a uh, uh, CS23 certification can be granted. Okay, so maybe we continue there and then, because we are, it's time to wrap up in a way. Um, Ken, yeah? In, in the vertical flight community, really, there's um, a couple things at play. First of all, um, the majority of the over 600 projects listed um, are they're going for Part 23 certification uh, as, a, in a sense, a vertical flight aircraft under a fixed wing category. And, you know, there's some progress in terms of people like Joby and others in terms of a certification path. Um, very few are looking the STC route, but uh, that also, I think, may be the uh, sleeper, the one that actually gets to the market first. Uh, tier 1 engineering is going to be flying in the next couple weeks. Uh, they're retrofitted the Robinson R44 of the Magni X Magni 350 engine. Uh, Magni X has the certification special conditions. They achieved those in November, so the mystery's gone out of a bit of the engine side. Uh, and because it's an STC, they're not certifying the whole aircraft. The challenge is the means of compliance of the system and coming to terms with that. But that might be the easiest certification path, the STC route, but certainly when it comes to vertical flight. Okay, thank you. I think it's time for me to wrap up a little bit, just for as additional information. Um, as I had to rush uh, you through the panels here, there are some more panels and some more detailed panels. For example, uh, I think the DLR is together with BTU is on Saturday giving a longer presentation of their whole approach which they do in Cottbus there. So if this is interesting of you, just look in the uh, guide, the special guide of the Aero where you'll have all the electric stuff. And I just say thank you to my panelists here talking to you, thank you for you listening. I know, I always see it, like if, it, if it's getting to an hour or le a longer, especially on the show, people are fading off because they have other things to do, that's why I think we're gonna have a coffee now. And uh, thank you for joining. And the next panel, which we have is tomorrow, same time, three o'clock, on uh, enablers for electric aviation and eVTO, which are all the other subjects apart from the uh, propulsion system, which are still on the plate and have to be fulfilled before the electric aircraft take off. Thank you very much.
How can you get eFlight Journal? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen like a conventional magazine or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.